known as PPAC. Um, I just want to thank all of you for coming tonight. I can't say how awesome it is to see this many people here. Um, yes, sorry. So,
PSA, and um, what Sarah said is is totally correct. I really, really wanted to print here because I wanted to print essentially a, a darkroom that was um, that was interested in supporting the Philadelphia photographic community. But also, it was the place that made the best prints, and so it was kind of it was more than serendipity. It was just spectacular. Um, and I looked and looked, and I was printing for this fancy, massive museum show, and I thought about it a lot, and I looked at prints, and I, I talked to other printers, and thought, you know, I can't really base my choice on theory. I have to base it on how great the prints are going to look, and it was both. And so I can't be any more fortunate to have worked with you and with Christopher on helping to polish up all of the images, some of which were a little bit difficult to get done. So thank you very, very much. Um, this is uh, this is Cynthia Prop, and she's on the poster that these guys are giving out. This, and then this is Cynthia uh, a little more than a month ago, the opening at the art museum. I generally don't keep in touch with many of the people who I make portraits of, but Cynthia, because I, I remembered her last name, and because I spoke at length with her and her mother, especially because I, I generally don't make photographs of children because I want to make sure that there's either a parent or someone present cognizant to actually be able to help make sure that the image is being made with full consent of everyone. Um, so I met just a few blocks from here, actually, Cynthia and her mom, and then I found Cynthia on Facebook and then invited them to the opening. So here they are on the opening day. And this photo was made, I would say, within 10 blocks of where we are right now. So it was a pretty beautiful moment, actually, to have that confluence of, um, of the print, of the people, and of the space. It was, it was awesome all around. So I don't know how much you guys know about uh, my work, but I'm totally going through, I'm whipping through a talk, and then I'm going for questions. That's how I like to roll. So for, um, for 10 years, from 2000 to 2010, I worked on one installation, one very specific installation, that where I showed photographs under I-95 in South Philadelphia once a year for uh, three hours. It was always the first weekend in May. And the plan um, kind of came fully formed and then moved forward from there, and it stayed the same for the duration of the 10 years. Start to finish, same plan. And the plan was to show 231 photographs on each available high left turn that were under, that was under the highway by Target in front of Nicholas in a very specific spot. And I started out showing them um, about two blocks away, three blocks away really, um, as I began to make the photographs. And I came up with the idea for the installation first, and then the photographs were second. So the photographs had to be made to actually construct the installation. And this is what it was like. This is a map of the way the installation worked. So if you wanted to buy a $5 color photocopy, you could at the front. And here at the installation, at the very bottom of the pillar, there were numbers chalked at the bottom so that you could take a look at the number and come up to the front and buy a $5 copy if you wanted. And this is as if you're looking directly down from on top of the highway onto it. The numbers were there, were not for order. You could move through the entire thing, as you come in and out as you were, and move in any way that you wanted. They were only there for ease of purchase if you wanted to get a five-buck copy. And each year, the installation began at 1 p.m. And the reason for that is because in May, at 1 p.m., there's a very distinct shaft of light that runs down the center of the, of the space underneath the highway. It changes throughout the year in terms of the sun's position, but in May, one is the, is the moment in which it's fully illuminated. And I wanted it to be very specific to space, and this was a very defining um, moment in terms of the space under the highway. And so to me, it was, very, it was imperative to define it with this kind of moment of illumination. And it, it worked uh, both when it was bright and there was a full strip of light that illuminated, that, that shone all the way down, and it also worked when it was raining, where there would be kind of a curtain of water that divided the two sides that dripped down. Here it is. Um, and so, the, I worked on this project for 10 years. That was it, my whole 30s. So, 30 to 40, and worked on it, and it became bigger and bigger and bigger, and I worked on it nonstop. And it was really just total life-changing, out of control, uh, full-blown compulsion. So there you go. Good night. <laughs> so, for, um, for the show, I just used the space. It just 
commandeered it. I never asked for a permit or had any interest. I actually actively opposed getting a permit to use the space. Um, it was cleaned every year. I cleaned it. In the beginning, it started I started cleaning it out about a month ahead of time, cleaning out the kind of big stuff that had come under the year. And then as it got closer, beginning um, uh, to the show, we, I would sweep like twice a week. And then the week of the show, my mother, who was here, and my wife and my siblings always helped to clean, to sweep, and to scrub, and to kind of get the whole, get the entire space prepped so that people could comfortably move it about it. Um, generally, the, the issues were just broken glass, or like sometimes, often though, I have to say, human feces was a problem one year, which I did a lot of cleaning, I have to say. <laughs> Worth it, really revolting, but really um, important to have the space um, as clean as could possibly be for presentation of show. So, and this is what it was like. The images were, um, in the very beginning, they were colored photocopies. And I started the project with the intent for it to be as transparent as possible. And part of that is that I began the project by actually making, um, by taking, using 35 millimeter film, then I would drop it off in a lab, and then the images would be blown up to 11 by 17, and then pasted onto the pillars. And then as I got more money, and I had kind of moved into the art world in a different way, I'm sorry I keep hitting this mic, because I have to gesticulate a lot, so it's going to keep happening. Just prepping for it. <laughs> um, so as I, as I began to have kind of a different movement in the art world, and I began to make more money, and I began to make prints in different ways, these prints became um, inkjet prints, uh, archival inkjet prints, which then I would laminate with an adhesive back, and they would go off the floor. This was something that, um, so they were the same images, essentially, that ended up being sold in, in a gallery that I had in York. They were the, the exact same print, the one that would go under 95 and the one that would be for sale for 700 bucks. And this was it from start to finish. And there's lots and lots and lots of, uh, I could talk for like 20 billion hours about I-95, which I almost still feel like I had not fully put the brakes on because I moved right into the museum show. So it's kind of as if I, I I hadn't, the, the show was done and the installation was complete and the last showing was actually, that was it, that was the end of it. And this museum show is a different telling of the narrative and it's in a different space with a lot of different reasons for why things kind of came about. But this was complete, those three hours were it, that was the end of it. And um, it was really, it was a it was a long haul, I have to say, well worth it. Um, the way, I-95 was structured, and, and the way that the museum show is also structured in some ways, is that there's a number of themes that run through it, um, none of which are very linear or didactic. They are all open to interpretation for the viewer. There's, very, there's no context or text to talk about uh, what the image means, and the image is presented fully for interpretation by the viewer, so the viewer does the work. Um, the way that 95 worked is that across um, I should say, running running south to north were a number of different themes. The first one was heavy on personal imagery. The second was heavy on fluidity of gender. The third on addiction and desire. The fourth on American identity. The fifth was about getting by. And the sixth was about hope and pride and joy. And they were not structured um, in a linear manner so that you could not actually read them directly if you moved down each row. Um, and there were sub-themes that moved across, so occasionally there would be images that would be uh, two blocks away that literally related to each other, that you either taught through time or through, um, through I would say, architectural structure, or there's any number of ways that they related. Um, but those were the themes that I worked at in order to kind of get at everything. 